A theme park owner asked me to film, by the way, thank you, Verbalance, for being a patron and joining the Discord. A theme park owner asked me to film his park and make a little video for him. I never did that. I have no name in the game. How much money can I charge for an FPV video? Um, I mean, there's people who would charge $1,500 a day. Um, there's people who would charge $500 a day. Uh, the people charging $500 a day probably are not in a sustainable business model, but they may be making, you know, some chump change here and there. Um, keep in mind that you will need a 107 if you want to do this legally. Um, also, just don't forget, like, you know, the quality could vary, too. So, like, what equipment do you have? What are you filming this with? Does the person making $2,000 a day have better equipment than you? You know, yeah. like, uh, really, the answer is you can charge what it's worth. If there's no FPV people around you and it would cost a marketing company ten grand for him to do this, then maybe you can make $4,000. You know what I mean? If Are you going to edit the video? Like, yeah. maybe you can make $500 because he doesn't care that much or he doesn't have a big budget for marketing on this thing, right? So I think you you really have to, like... There's a lot of variables that go into yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, another way to look at it is the price is – there's two ways to look at it. One is that you will charge what you need to charge to make the amount of money that you need to make. Okay? So like the guys out there who are charging like $300, $500 for a fly-through, ultimately that's not a sustainable business model for most people. Now, obviously, everybody's different, right? But like eventually – you will crash or lose a quad and need to buy a new quad. You will crash your quad and break a window and the customer will want you to pay for the window. Something will happen in your business. You will eat away at your profits with gas money on your car and then your car will break down and then you won't be able to get to a job and you'll need to pay for the repair of your car. There are all these hidden costs to business. And somebody says, I went to work and I worked for four hours uh, and I made $500. Well, that's a pretty freaking great deal. But you're not taking into account all those hidden costs that either haven't hit you yet or you're maybe you're like you're people who uh, do DoorDash and stuff and they're not actually accounting for the wear and tear of their car when they think about how much money they made. And then eventually their car wears out. They have to buy a new car and they don't have the money for it, right, is a, is a thing that happens to some people. The other thing that can happen is that uh, you can – you can be charging a small amount of money. Uh, wait, crap. I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Charging $500 a day, not enough money, sustainable business. Um, the other side of it is, so you charge what you need to charge to make the amount of money you need to make to make your business sustainable and make you able to live the way you want to live. The other side of it is you charge what the customer is willing to pay. Charge, to pay. So like, let's say that you're the best drone pilot in the world and you charge $2,000 a day, and, and you're, you've got work, you're booked, you're booked for, for six months, you're booked out at $2,000 a day, you're doing great. And then this theme park owner comes along and says, hey, let's see you fly drones. You want to do a little fly through of my theme park? And you go, sure, absolutely, $2,000. And he's like, oh, I can't pay that. What, are you kidding me? What, do you think I'm made of money? Well, you're not going to get his business. That's okay, because you got a plenty of other business. So, like, how much should you charge him? I don't know. If you would do it for free just because you think it's fun? I mean, I would consider doing it for free just because you think it's fun. Especially if you don't have any experience. Uh, a local guy, a local guy who I know, who's a realtor, reached out to me and he said, Hey, I've got this house. It's a multi-million dollar house. It's going to be the most expensive house I've ever sold. It's completely staged. It's beautiful. And I want a drone fly through. And I said, at first we had been talking and I was like, yeah, I'll come out. I'll do a drone fly through for you. Whatever. It'll be fun. And when I realized he, he and I, then I got busy and I was like, I'm sorry, I don't think I can do it. And he was like, look, I'll pay you. And I realized, oh shit, this guy's trying to hire me. We're not just friends sitting around talking, shooting the shit. And I was like, you know what? I don't do enough real estate fly-throughs to charge you money for a real estate fly-through. If we're just shooting the shit, I'll do it. I'll make you a little video and you can have fun with it. But if you actually need a quality video for a multi-million dollar real estate listing, you need somebody who knows what the frick they're doing. So like, if you've never done this kind of fly-through before, maybe you shouldn't charge him anything. 
And I know there's people who say never work for free, but like you don't know what the hell you're doing and you're just going to come out and do it for fun and say, look, there, I'll come out, I'll do it for fun and I'll give you what I get. Go ahead, Blunty. The Part of the point here is that if you've never done this before, it's not free. You're getting free access into a place and building a portfolio with a client who needs it, right? Yep. So like – like, uh, it would be free if you could go to any theme park and film anytime you want and put that on a portfolio and learn all the time and you have a client you could work with and figure out the, you know what I mean? Like, there, yeah. there's a part of learning the business, like learning how to do the job. What happens when you show up? How much equipment do you need? How many batteries do you need to take? How long are the filming pieces? How long should they be? What footage do you need before you go to editing? Are you going to have to edit it as somebody else? How many SD cards? Like, there's all these pieces of information that come into a, a shoot, right? And, like, you're going to learn that that value is going to come from being able to do it. So you've got to decide, like like Margo was saying, do you do it for free and get that experience on the thing? You build a portfolio, you get a client who likes you. Uh, do you just need to find out if you can even do the job? Maybe you can, yeah. but you did it for free, yeah. so nobody's on the line, right? It doesn't yep. matter. Yep. So like, there's a lot of variables. The other thing to remember is if you ever want to do this for a business, like half that money is going to taxes. So well, uh, don't that, forget about that. I always say that, and I suspect <laughs> that a lot of people out there are just working for cash and not reporting it on their taxes. And so, like, I almost, I, I, I usually, like, everybody has to drive to work. And, like, so, like, I talk about wear and tear in the car, gas, mileage, of time, etc. I almost even don't bring up taxes because I feel like people go, oh, look at Goody Two Shoes Bardwell paying his taxes. <laughs> what a loser, you know, but it's true. <laughs> a substantial amount of it will go to taxes when you charge the customer. So taxes, payroll, all this bullshit. And if you're running a business and you're not doing that, then eventually it may bite you. Maybe it may not bite you. So. Uh, you um, pinned another message here, which is a, I did. a good, uh, good, yeah, good thing uh, to point out. Hold on one second. Let me, let's finish this okay. thought, though. Um, so if if this literally is your first time doing it and you literally would do it for free because it's fun, then tell the guy, look, I don't have any experience with this. I'll just do it for fun and for the experience, and I'll give you like what I get, but I don't have any expectation that it's going to be like excellent. I hope you like it, and we'll just do it as a trade. But you, you do want to be aware that there's a lot of people out there who are like, do this free work for me. It'll be good for your portfolio. And like, f fuck those people, right? Like, eventually, you reach a point where you, you have to value your time and value your work and charge what a fair, is a fair amount. And, and like, you, you got to know when you reach that point, right? But in this case, you may not be at that point. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about this. If you do it for free, no part 107 required. Uh, let's let's take it in the chat. Hang on, Blunty, don't give away the answer. I'm going to do a poll. Do a poll. If you work for free, do you need a 107? Um, if you uh, do commercial work for free, so like a, a fly-through of an amusement park, a real estate fly-through, yes, no. Start poll. Let's see what the chat says. If you do commercial for free, do you need a 107? Hmm, let's see. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see the results in live. Though I can see the live results of the poll. That is correct. The chat is absolutely correct. You do need a 107. So, the way it works is, if the, Blunty, tell me if I get this right. If the flight is purely for recreational purposes, then there's an exemption. I think it's section 333, and you do not need a 107. If the flight is not purely for recreational purposes, then you need a 107. And here's the thing. Nowhere in there do they say, if you don't take any money for it, it's free. It's good. You're good to go. When I do a flight for an owner of a business with the expectation that I will give the owner of the business that footage and they will use it to, to aid their business, that is not a purely recreational flight. That is a flight in furtherance of a business interest, and you need a 107. It doesn't matter if money changes hands. The example I like to use is if my brother is a real estate agent, if my brother owns a car dealership, and he says, hey, you want to come fly your drone around my lot? If I go, yeah, I'd love to fly my your drone around your lot. And I, if I just go out and I rip some packs, that's a recreational flight. 
But the minute he says, I want you to do a fly through for me and I'm going to put it on my website, you need a 107. Doesn't matter if money exchange hands. Blunty, how'd I do? That's correct. I think the, the way that I like to say it is like Fancy Picker just said was intent. So it's about the intent at the time of flight is what's really important. So there's going to be people in chat, I've already seen them say it, which is that you could just say that you intended to fly recreationally, right? You asked the guy who was there, he said, yeah, you could fly, no problem. And then you flew around, and then later he goes, hey, let me get that footage. And you go, well, okay, I was just flying for fun. And you go, okay, well, here's the footage. And then he does what he wants with the footage. Uh, Now, if you were to try to sell him that footage, I think you need the 107, even though you're selling it from recreational footage. That part I don't agree. I think that's a little fuzzy. I think that your your read of the ins and of the vagaries of the FAA is probably pretty accurate because you think about this stuff a lot. But like the example I like to use is if I'm flying at the park recreationally and during that flight aliens land and I capture the footage, the the intent at the time of flight was sincerely and honestly purely recreationally. If I then sell the footage to the news, I don't retroactively need a 107 would be my argument. Do you think the FAA wouldn't, or the FC, yeah, the FAA would go That's for that? That's an example. That's like one of the example questions, I think. It's like something similar to that. Like if you're filming recreationally and you see a crime or something, you mm-hmm. can share that with the news without any penalty. But, yeah. my, but my question is, can you sell it to the news without any penalty? Sure. Why not? Okay. I didn't know if the sale would, is any, would, makes any difference, right? I would like, argue, I would argue, and I think that I would, I think this is right, that the intent at the time of flight is what matters. If I have record, well, if I, you know, let's say, you know, I don't know, I could make up examples. If I sincerely flew a recreational flight with no non-recreational intent in my heart, and then later for some reason that footage becomes worth money, I can sell it. How, what do I, I will never have had a 107 at the time of flight, Plenty. What am I going to do? I'm going to go get a 107 before I receive the check. I didn't have a 107 when I took the flight and I can never change that. Would be my right. argument. I understand, but the, but yeah, the, the vice the converse the converse is that like if you did it more than once, like yeah, yeah no, obviously and, just and, as a way to circumvent yeah, the rule, no, right? like people are like aha the loophole all these flights that I'm doing are recreational and I just so happen to sell them afterwards. Like eventually the FAA, if the FAA is trying to ding you for not having a 107, they're going to be like you're going to be in front of a judge. It's not like this is some magic get out of jail card. Eventually, the FAA finds you, and eventually, you go in front of a judge, and you say, Your Honor, all of these flights are recreational. And the FAA lawyer goes, This guy's full of shit. And then the judge goes, Yeah, I think you're full of shit. And then, ding, you get fined. So, like, it's not a magic get-out-of-jail-free card. Um, Um, The other thing to remember, for people who don't know that much about the situation, or just just to paint the real picture here, enforcement is completely different than the conversation we're having. Right? Yes. The conversation we're having is about the legal rule and what you would want to do if you're trying to follow the rules uh, by the letter. right? But like mm-hmm. the chance that anybody's going to catch you, and the chance that you're going to get fined as opposed to just some message from the FAA saying yeah. like, hey man, everything's cool, uh, but you can't do this. like, Or hey, did you actually mean to do this? And then they'll kind of you're kind of be on the list or whatever, right? Like that's sort of the idea, right? Like uh, mm-hmm. the, the chances of you getting a fine for this immediately are very low, slim to none. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Bob Bruce wants to know: I flew for a burnout contest. No money was exchanged. Nobody asked me for the footage. I made my own vids from them and shared them. Would that be considered recreational? I think that that's possible. That that would be recreational. There would need to be some details there. So, for example, uh, Bob Bruce, if you run. Bob Bruce's Drone Burnout Videos Incorporated, and your YouTube channel is all drone burnout videos, I think then if the FAA was like saying, hey, do you have a 107? Did you need one for this flight? And you were to go, no, it was purely recreational. And they'd be like, well, you've got this monetized YouTube channel and you're selling these DVDs of this exact same content you were making there. I don't believe you that it's recreational. But like if there's no other evidence that there was a non-recreational intent at the time of flight, the fact that you distributed the footage doesn't make it commercial in nature, as long as you, like, especially if you didn't sell the footage. But even if you did sell the footage, like, I think you could try to argue that it was a recreational flight, and only later did you change your mind. Although I think that argument is, it's kind of hard to, like, sell that argument to the, like, I wouldn't want to be in a position of making that argument to the FAA. I would be like, uh, 
I would I definitely suspect- have gotten a 107 if I was going to sell them so I could at least say, yeah, no, I got a 107. Go ahead. I suspect there's a reason the FAA uses only a similar example to what you did, which is something to the effect of, like, if you're doing something and then a crime happens or there's a fire or whatever, an extreme circumstance, then you can Mm -hmm. share that footage. I think they say that because, like, that's the interpretation they're going to use, right? The Mm -hmm. goal is for you not to build a business out of flying recreationally and avoiding getting a 107. It's a test and 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 a license to the uh, the government and then you're done right so they just want you to get the stupid license that's kind of the idea behind it, so. what about this one blunty my friend it's- got his roof redone and he asked me to take my drone up and look at his roof no money changed hands no favors changed hands it was purely just a favor to a friend but was it re- was it recreational do I need a 107 for that? What's your opinion? You do need a 107 for that. The FAA specifically uses that example. You are doing commercial work. Commercial work is viewing a roof. It is not recreational to view a roof. Right. You are inspecting you the quality of roof. the work now, that listen, was done. You could look at your own roof. Now, he could fly the drone and look at his own roof. Okay? But why? But That's not recreational. His roof. No, but you're doing work on your own house, so it's DIY. It's like electrical. You don't need a permit or whatever. That's my understanding of how what? it works. It's for your own That equipment. doesn't make any sense. That's totally arbitrary. My understanding is if you're doing it on your own, it's not commercial. But if you're doing a job you? for someone else, even if it's for free, you're trading You're trading something. I right, believe you, but, 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 but do, do you see that that's totally arbitrary? If it, I, if the, I if mean, the it's the arbitrary, but I can define the, the wait, difference. Wait, wait, wait. If the threshold is purely recreational purpose... And they're saying that if I'm inspecting a roof, that's not recreation, unless I just happen to really like looking at roofs, recreation. No, if I'm inspecting the quality of the work to assess the quality of the work, the the FAA says that's not recreational. It shouldn't matter whose damn roof I'm looking at. Either it's recreational or it's not. I would argue. I'm just saying I know that specific example is used, and I don't. I guess I don't know if they mean you can use do your own. But my understanding was you could fly over your own house. But either way, the whole point of this is that that none of that matters. You could fly over your friend's roof recreationally and share the footage. That's the point right. of this. It's about nobody, intent. Nobody cares. Nobody you can't. Cares. Nobody can tell you if you can fly over somebody else's roof or not. If you happen to give him the footage later and he happens to use it for that, that has nothing to do with well, you. So and, it's completely fine. And the reality is that it's fun to kind of nitpick these because it's, like, interesting to think about the law. But the reality is nobody cares. Yeah, put your DJI Mavic up and take pictures of your friend's roof and tell them, hey, your, your shingles are screwed up. No one cares. No one cares. It's only in egregious cases where the FAA becomes aware of something crazy going on that they even try to enforce this. Okay. Rick LeBlanca says, this discussion shows how not thought out the regulation is. That's every single regulation. Go look at any regulation and how it's applied. Yep. It's the same. Yep. All right. Moving on. Good good discussion. Thank you, Blunty. Thanks for your contribution there. Blunty, I always ref- I always rely on him uh, when it comes to questions about regulations and stuff because he works with the FPV Freedom Coalition, fpvfc.org, uh, in advocacy uh, organization. I think advocacy is fair to say, uh, who tries to uh, sh- help shape and direct drone-related regulation in the United States and help educate and assist uh, drone pilots. Um, I had a guy contact me recently, Plenty, and he said his FRIA application had been rejected several times. And I said, reach out to the FPV Freedom Coalition, and I'll bet you they can help figure out why it's getting rejected and help you sort of structure it so that it can have, be more likely to be approved. And that's, uh, that's the kind of thing you guys do. So kudos. Uh, let's take this question from Farmer Trucker, who is also in the Discord. Um, oh, oh, hang on. No, this is too good. I got to get this one. I'll come back to you, Farmer Trucker. With the new Supreme Court decision about Chevron deference, how uh, how much of Part 107 did Congress write? Um, I am not a lawyer. So you should take this as the blatherings of a non-lawyer. But I did sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I'll tell you my opinion. Um, I feel like the argument... That the Chevron deference decision means 107 uh, and so forth are, you know, remote ID are, you know, just w- withheld, uh, you know, invalid. I don't think that has a lot of weight because I think that of the regulations that you might point to, uh, I feel like the FAA regulations have more statutory basis than some of the other ones that people have pointed to. Um, there, there, there is like the FAA Reauthorization Act and so on. 
and I think they provide a, a, a stronger uh, statutory basis. Um, also, keep in mind that Chevron deference doesn't say that every regulation without a statutory basis is invalid. The share, and you can watch Legal Eagle. Legal Eagle is a YouTube channel about the law. He's one of the best, I think, and he has a video about the Chevron decision. Uh, the 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 uh, striking down Chevron deference, if you will, simply means that the court is not obligated to respect the regulations if they don't have a statutory basis. But the court may still just decide to respect the regulations and let them stand even if they don't have a statutory basis. So I just don't think there's any there's any world where the Chevron decision affects remote idea or 107 in any way. Because uh, I hear people and they're like, aha, with the Chevron decision, all of this is moot. I can do whatever I want. And I'm like, that is not how it works. <laughs>